All right, so, so welcome everyone, both um, who's here for the first time as well as all the returning ones. Um, we tried to pack this day with a lot of the recent announcements uh, that we've been working on, both us and the rest of the Azure teams uh, at Microsoft. And uh, a call out is we have all of the sessions, both from today as well as the past pre-days, available on YouTube already on demand. You can assist any of them. So there's a ton of topics that we're not going to cover today because we're limited to these 24 hours uh, and technically eight hours or, or Nate will kick us out. Um, and so if you want to know for things like, you know, go deep on development or on um, scaling uh, or on resiliency, on uh, global applications, distribution across regions, we have all those topics on previous pre-days and we're probably going to revisit them as we move forward. Check it out on, on YouTube. Um, and also give us feedback, let us know throughout the halls what else would you like to see, uh, and we'll try to cover them on future pre-days, no fingers crossed, uh, for next KubeCon and, and onwards. So for today, I'd like to kind of just set our context a little bit, and then I'll move it on to the really interesting sessions uh, from the rest of the AKS team, uh, our uh, Azure partners, as well as our uh, esteemed um, partners from our marketplace of Kubernetes apps that we'll have in the afternoon. And to kind of set that up, I would just kind of, a realization that I think all of you are pretty uh, familiar with is kind of the dynamic times uh, that we're facing as well as the urgency throughout these times. They're both kind of challenging, they're dynamic, there's a lot of urgency with them, uh, they continuously shift. So economic conditions, you know, are we in a recession, are we not, are we going towards one, are we leaving one, is it a bubble, big bubble, mega bubble, small bubble, all kinds of bubbles. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, it's really just challenging to navigate these times. Um, and a lot of what we see from, what we hear from a lot of you is the challenges, but also some of the opportunities around it. Uh, that's also how we're approaching it uh, at Microsoft and the AKS team. We ourselves had a lot of the same struggles to navigate, like what, what we need to do, what do we need to prioritize, how do we better respond to the needs of our users, which also change and continuously shift with these challenging times, and how can we actually better serve them? And so we kind of sit down uh, quite literally to think about uh, how to maybe shift some of the things we're doing, how to maybe adapt some of the things we're doing to meet uh, a lot of the different needs that these times require. But also, how to facilitate some transition or some uh, ability to go from basically responsive to actually and reactive to actually proactive and actually getting to some growth. So a lot of that is what we've been doing with our users across the globe. Uh, we're very privileged to have a ton of uh, great names and about 95% of the Fortune 500 working with us in AKS. Um, some of them all the way since inception, which we're really, really proud to, um, to have. Uh, some of them more recent, some of them doing things in the AI space, some of them doing things in all kinds of different industries from FSI to automotive, automotive to retail. Um, and that has put us in a very, very, very lucky position. Uh, I feel very privileged to, to be able to work with all these different industries and customers and have all the different requirements, use cases, feedback coming from all these different areas for us and pushing us to kind of go to the next uh, frontier, go to the actual next set of problems that I'm sure you, a lot of you share uh, together with them. Now, one thing that I normally like to talk about a lot is how Microsoft itself has been pushing and striving to make Azure a Kubernetes powered cloud, which is really two-folded. Uh, on one end, actually ensuring that it is the centerpiece and the core of a lot of the things that we're working on. And you'll see a lot of them throughout uh, the day today. You'll see a lot of the efforts that a lot of the Azure teams and Microsoft teams have been putting around it, and that really uh, makes in, in many aspects uh, Kubernetes and AKS a lot of the atom of innovation across the cloud native efforts that we're doing in Azure. But then on the other hand, a lot of the Microsoft teams themselves um, have been doing a ton of innovation on top of AKS quite literally and on top of Kubernetes quite literally. And uh, you can see several of the efforts here from you know, teams and its uh, at scale growth to uh, Xbox and Xbox Live services, to uh, the Office and uh, Bing search, all the way to the GitHub Copilot control planes and many, many, many more. Uh, we have many services today that are built 
in Azure that are built on top of AKS as well as the rest of the Microsoft portfolio. And that's a, another reason why um, I talk about the Kubernetes powered cloud. It's because it's really, it's Atom, a unit of innovation, but it's also the actual foundational piece where a lot of our services are innovating on top of and are using. And once again, much like with the previous case, that puts a very, let's call it healthy pressure, healthy stress uh, in us to actually get to the levels of scale, get to the, the set of requirements that these internal teams that have huge global use cases put on us, uh, and also the help they give us, um, quite literally, in defining, in executing a lot of those same requirements that uh, all of us share. And so we're really proud to kind of be hosting all of these uh, different teams and use cases and many more to come as well. And from all of these innovations through AI to the actual open AI and chat GPT itself that has been both developed, trained, and still runs on AKS today with the help of a Cosmos DB and developed uh, in GitHub um, since day one. So really, really, really um, proud to continue a very strong and close partnership with OpenAI that we've had for several years now and continues to increase. We continue to have even more. I mean, I was chatting with them this morning still, um, to, which leads some of my colleagues to ask, when, when do I sleep? Um, but again, it's mostly the jet lag. And it, it's a team that has really been so dynamic and so uh, fast-paced that uh, we're pretty happy to, to continue to partner with them. So all of these kind of comes together in why, right? Why are all of these teams kind of leveraging AKS and Kubernetes to essentially respond to the, those dynamic and challenging times, to those needs and to those requirements that we saw before? And the big reason for it is the focus on taking that step back and saying, what do we actually need? What does the business actually require? What can we actually get from it? Not just from adopting another technology or another platform, but how can it actually make our business better, create new channels, increase our productivity, uh, accelerate onboarding, reduce churn, create a portable standard that we can use across any environment. And these are, uh, I'm kind of quoting from a lot of the things in this slide that you can also read. Uh, this is a public study that you can check uh, from Forrester from last year. Uh, from uh, actual users of uh, AKS and Kubernetes on Azure that have responded, and all the way to reducing the number of outages that they've had uh, because of the self-healing nature of Kubernetes together with um, the different resiliency mechanisms that AKS and Azure offers. So let me share with you a video of one of the customers and users that actually used AKS and took a step back on actually focusing on their uh, outcomes and how they use that you might recognize a brand. The Lego house is this ultimate Lego experience. That's why we call us the home of the brick. The house is built on learning through play. It is the core of Lego house. We believe that you can learn a lot through play. And that's also why we have around 10 interactive experiences. You can drive with robots. You can build a stop motion video. You can create your mood, help build a city. We want to create those canvases around the house where people get inspired because there are endless possibilities in the Lego brick. We have in the last five, six years really learned how to operate Lego house, but we're also ready to take the next step. We want to modernize our platform. We want to build on modern components, modern technologies where we ongoingly can improve our experiences, where we can change according to what we see with the guests. One of the things that we struggled with was that everything was run on-premise, meaning that it's super hard to error correct, it's super hard to update, and so on. The plan is that we will actually rebuild the full house to run on Azure and Azure Kubernetes service, to really create that flexibility and scalability in our digital tech stack. Azure empowers our developers in the way that we can utilize a lot more of the technologies built in the whole Lego ecosystem. We have the Lego group just across the street. Suddenly we can talk together in a different way and uh, exploit different opportunities and maybe hand some of the great things we built here to other part of the ecosystem, whether that's Legoland or retail stores. The short-term impact will be to make the house even more stable than it is today, providing a higher uptime. 
then over time my dream is that we can basically add new features, try things out, provide new services for our guests, new experiences. We also need to learn on an ongoing basis and the only way we learn is to bring the technology into the hands of our guests and see if that helps them getting a better learn through play experience. And then we can make the house better and better and better. As a, as a long time LEGO enthusiast, this can't help to put a smile on my face uh, of this partnership we've done uh, with LEGO and a lot more things to come. Uh, we're still exploring a lot of the potential of this partnership, uh, so you'll be hearing a lot more about it uh, in, um, shortly after. Now, one of the set of key principles that made this partnership possible and many more, I'm sure a lot of these uh, hopefully resonate with a lot of you as well. This has been, uh, I would say the pillars and the, the guidelines, the guardrails of how we've been driving all our innovation, all our thinking, uh, from ensuring that just not only a reliable platform to host applications, but that we're also focusing on uh, the productivity of developers to enable all of those uh, outcomes of increased speed and agility and velocity, to the delivery of fully managed operations and security. Uh, we typically call them kind of end-to-end -end opinions that we immediately contrast with that choice and extensibility. We want to make sure that we live up to, uh, and it's a tall order to live up to, to the principles of Kubernetes itself, of ensuring that we are uh, providing with that kind of safe experience and a gated experience, and one that we bake in uh, kind of out-of-the-box scenarios and opinions, but still critically allow you to plug unplug um, and extend to whatever different solutions you might prefer, to whatever different patterns you might prefer. Kubernetes has this absolutely flexible API, it's this flexible infrastructure and portable that you can run anywhere, and we wanna make sure that we don't compromise uh, an inch on that, and that you can still leverage anything that you use in any Kubernetes environment, and same thing, that the solutions that we build will work on any Kubernetes environment, you can swap, plug and play as much as you, as you can. And finally, that at the end, but not least important, is the ability to build, especially today, in a world where uh, consumers and users, whatever they're internal or external, are ever demanding, uh, where most businesses have become digital after a while now, and they're getting really, really um, the, the asks of mature software businesses that have been doing this for many, many years, there's really, no room for error, no room for outages, no room for uh, any type of downtime, no patience, no tolerance from any users on that. And so really that's been a big focus for us, not just on the service, but also in the mechanisms that we provide, uh, hopefully to all of you, to ensure that you're achieving you know, uh, that reliability, that global presence, uh, that resilience across. All right, so hopefully that was a good context. Um, the one more thing that I would mention before we kind of start to delve a little bit into some of the, the recent stuff we've done and some of the newer is a good bridge to a lot of the rest of the day. A lot of the, the things we do here, uh, we're again privileged to be here kind of fronting this. We have a lot of our partners here, but this is just a little fraction of all the teams working um, uh, back at Microsoft right now. Uh, well, hopefully not in the US because it's a bit late, but uh, across the world. Um, that are making a lot of this possible and are making that kind of dream of the Kubernetes powered cloud to serve that to you uh, possible as well. So we're gonna be seeing uh, some samples of the work that the team has been doing both in the AKS side as well as uh, broadly in Azure. So the first is who here has already tried the Azure Copilot? You hands, halves, okay. So this is gonna be fairly new for some of you. Uh, grab onto your seats. Um, who here has seen an Azure Copilot demo before. About the same crew, ooh, this is gonna be interesting. So the Azure Copilot um, is, um, kind of as the name indicates, um, a Copilot experience that we built specifically for Azure. It's embedded in the Azure portal. It is available to all of you to kind of request. The links are up there, uh, and we're happy to, uh, to onboard you into the previews and to start collecting your feedback. It is currently in preview. Uh, and we have tremendous success with all the users that have been using it, the feedback we've been getting, the scenarios that we didn't even thought possible. These are some of the ones that we started with, help with things like troubleshooting, diagnosing any issues, answering questions, 
uh, with contacts, generating YAML, which is always a pain, especially from scratch, um, getting questions on queries, uh, which is my possibly my favorite one. Uh, it's just actually just asking how to do KQL queries, uh, GraphQL, whatever it is. Uh, the language, I don't know it. So if I have to write a query, I'll typically just start in Copilot and actually ask it to write me a query on something, and I'll start from there. Typically, we'll just nail it in the first one anyway. But there's quite more. Um, there's uh, best practices and recommendations that you can ask, like which, which different CNI should I use for which scenarios, which kind of toggles serve which purpose, and even more, in the, the, the near future, you'll start to see AKS-specific actions as part of Copilot, meaning that you're actually gonna be able to tell it things like, can you scale my cluster? Can you add a node pool? Can you scale my node pool? Can you enable a specific add-on or a specific feature? And Copilot will do that for you uh, as well. Moreover, uh, we're rolling out an experience that allows you to have this also on the CLI. I know a lot of you, and knowing some of you, you might actually not use the portal that often, so you're more of a uh, CLI type of person, guilty as charged myself as well. And so we wanna make sure that you also have this uh, at your fingertips and you don't need to use a UI to get these same capabilities. So you have this available on the CLI and also uh, shortly in VS Code 2 and I'll show you some of those interfaces as well. All right, but I know especially for those of you that have never seen this, probably looking to how this actually looks like. So I'm gonna show you some of the most recent things that we've been working on. All of those things that I mentioned, by the way, are already in the preview, you can go and test them. This is something that we're currently finishing up and about to release um, in the next few weeks. So this you will not see in the portal yet, even if you're in the preview, but you'll see it in the, uh, the next few weeks. And this is a addition, so if you're in AKS and in the AKS portal, you're gonna be uh, typically able to deploy YAML, pull up a YAML editor, start to create things there, copy paste from the docs or from samples, and that's typically what you go for. Um, but we thought, well, we have a ton of things already integrated with GitHub Copilot. We can just integrate that into our YAML editor as well. So you can actually pull up Copilot to help you create this YAML. You can pull up a section and actually tell it, hey, can you please actually update this to use my, the latest Nginx, not whatever version this sample had. And it will immediately just do that. You can you know, visualize the diff either in place or separately. You can apply it but it gets cooler than that. Imagine you paste something like this. One of the things that frustrates me the most is missing indentation out of samples and copy paste. You can actually do an automatic format and it will actually make all the indentation for you. Simple detail uh, makes a world of difference to me and to my eyes. Uh, and you actually get to get all of those automatically formatted and indented for you in there, even if you know, it lost formatting and copy pasting. Directly from the Learn Kubernetes samples, you can actually see that there's a problem with this because this deployment and this service is actually, they're not linked in any way. They're missing our labels right there and our selectors. So we just typed fix and Copilot detected that using the context of what's in that YAML file and added that section. Moreover, part of the reason we're doing with this Copilot is to ensure that everybody has a chance to learn and follow up with Kubernetes. So you can actually just highlight the piece and just say, can you explain what this does to me? And you'll get an explanation in this case what that uh, match labels and this metadata fields are for. And finally, this is the actual experience that probably a lot of you that are using Copilot today already know, which is the chat experience that you can just load up in any blade in the portal and start using right away. So this is where you would typically go on and say, hey, write me a KQL query. Please help me use this log analytics workspace. Tell me how it works. Explain me the difference between this and that. And you can actually help me fix my node that is uh, overcommitted, and you can use that for it. You can now also have this in-context uh, set of actions within your YAML editor and portal as well. And you can use this obviously in combination with VS Code and GitHub Copilot as an example in VS Code. Uh, you can also uh, use this, all of this in combination with automated deployments that help you get code from GitHub or ADO into AKS through pipelines, because this is typically a, a more imperative way, so you're typically doing something. Maybe you're testing something, getting something, creating a YAML file, testing it out quickly. 
This is not you deploying, obviously. That automated deployments allows you to go from here to then actually having a full setup CI CD pipeline in GitHub or ADO with this and your respective source code very, very easily. All right, so this is a bit on Copilot. You're going to see a lot of uh, showcases here and there throughout our day in our different sessions on different ways that Copilot powers a lot of our experiences from troubleshooting to uh, networking to cost, and you'll see a lot of. Uh, the power that it brings to you. Now, shifting gears, some of the things that we announced recently as well is uh, the general availability of Azure Container Storage. And that has been uh, a very interesting approach to how we're doing cloud native storage in AKS um, that provides not just persistency, but also uh, simplifies the usage of uh, ephemeral disks and local NVMEs uh, through the AC Store uh, interface. Um, and it's very, very simple. One of the things that folks really wanted is, okay, I have this kind of two-step. Uh, I'd love for the experience to be a lot more integrated with AKS. And so the team has been working on this, and now you can actually enable AC Store uh, directly in the AKS CLI. So you see that enable Azure Container Storage right there in uh, the CLI. And you can, once you type that command, you can just go to the portal, which is a little bit easier to see, I know, for, for those of you in the back. Uh, and you can actually go to the extensions blade and see that the AC Store, the Azure Container Storage extension uh, is installed, and we can go on to use this right now. So then at this point, you can use all kinds of different scenarios. Uh, and AC Store has a ton of value in how it uh, provides more performance, faster failovers, um, and just easier to use uh, storage at scale. In this case, we can deploy something like a, an elastic um, Helm chart, and we could go on uh, and see, okay, we have um, all the pods uh, running, some of them still initializing. And if we get the different horizontal pod scalers, you can see that there's different targets and different percentages there so that when we actually start to do uh, some ingestion, these things are expected to kind of scale, the pods. But together with those pods, we also expect persistent volumes to scale with them. And this could actually make the delay quite a bit. Typically, you'd normally be using th something like an Azure disk, and you'd have to wait for the disk to be created and then be attached to the VM wherever that pod is. Sometimes the pod would need to wait for that disk to be attached so that it, it gets to the same node. With AC Store, that is much, much quicker. Uh, we're here running some of that ingestion right away and hammering it pretty hard. And after this, you can actually see the scale happening pretty much instantaneously, and all those uh, pods have PVs attached to them, so you can see all those ingests and all those coordinatings right there, all with persistent volumes being created immediately. So typically you have to wait minutes um, to actually get this level of scale uh, at this stage, and here it just worked pretty much instantaneously. So really, really good um, performance, and this is just kind of the scaling up. You get the same level of performance obviously scaling down, but also failing over. As pods move from one node to another, maybe one node crashes, something happens, you get that same level of performance and instantaneous uh, look and feel as pods move from one node with their attached storage as well. All right, so that's Azure Container Storage. Another thing, also on the stateful side of the house that we uh, recently GA'd and that we're really happy to. And once again, all of these are hopefully demonstrating a lot of that Kubernetes power cloud mentality that, that I mentioned before, is our uh, Azure backup for AKS. So this is a, a Kubernetes native solution for backup that basically bridges together the capabilities of Azure backup and the backing up capabilities of um, the container storage interface of Kubernetes, um, and is built as typically on top of open source solutions like Valero. And let's actually see how it works, because I think the really powerful of this solution uh, is, is showcased as you actually see it in action. So everybody here you know, uh, might know what you need in terms of a use case of backup. You're trying to restore something that might fail or trying to take a backup that you might want to restore if something fails. So these are the typical steps, right? Rest backup and restore. So let's look at a cluster that essentially has a WordPress um, and a MySQL uh, database that is using, right there, one pod each. And what we want to do is we want to be able to back up this workload, respective uh, 
kind of front end as well as the database. And then we're going to do two things. We're going to restore it to a recovery cluster in this region, but we're also going to do a region failover, and we're going to restore it to a different cluster in a different region. This is our website. Very complex. And what we're going to be doing now is just going to scroll down in the AKS blade to our backup blade right there, and we're just going to hit configure backup. From here, we're going to select a vault. We could also create one at this uh, stage. So if you already have a vault that you're using for different um, scenarios, maybe different clusters, maybe you have several clusters uh, from the same team, you can also uh, leverage the existing back, uh, backup vault. And here you have basically your operational kind of backup for seven days and also off-site backup uh, for 28 days. And you can configure kind of these retention settings as well as you typically do with, with backup vaults. After this, you're going to actually select what you want to backup. So you can actually be very granular about what you want to uh, take backups off. So you could select some namespaces, all namespaces, some applications, all applications. In this case, we're going to select our MySQL demo KubeCon namespace. You can then even do more granular selections like do labels instead of just going through namespaces. Um, we could be using Secret Store or Key Vault, but in this case, it's using a direct secret because it's a demo. So we're actually going to back up this secret as well so we can actually restore and it will immediately work right away. So after this is done, and all looks okay, all looks validated, we're going to go ahead and um, select the resource group where we want that snapshot to go into, and that backup to go into. And after validation has succeeded and passed, we have now basically finished configuring our backup. Now if we hit our uh, refresh right there, you're going to be able to see essentially our uh, backup protection configuration that we just configured for this cluster uh, right there. All right, so we've configured backup. We don't yet have a backup. It's just configured. So we could now kind of wait, let it be there until it actually takes uh, that recurring backup. But again, we're trying to get to show some stuff, so I'm actually going to back it up now, right now. So I'm going to click backup now. And it's going to initiate that. So now the actual backup agents that are running there in the cluster are going to do their, their work and are going to back up that MySQL WordPress application. And once they're complete, you're going to see it move from that in-progress column in the middle to the uh, completed column on the right. And you see that we have our operational backup right there, which is an incremental type. So uh, moving forward, uh, every new backup will just uh, get the deltas of the changes from this previous backup. And if we go into our uh, subscription, we're now going to try to do a restore. So we're going to restore this backup that we just did into a cluster. So we have a primary and kind of a recovery. And right now, we're going to start that restore and actually get the um, operational backup we just took into a different cluster. We found our backup. Again, typically, you can have a bunch of restore points showing up in this list. We just did one right now, so there's only one. And now we're going to go ahead and select our recovery cluster, which is appropriately named so we don't confuse them. So we, have, we were in our primary cluster, and now we're going to uh, we covered this again. This is same region so far. So these are two clusters in the same region. Could be a move that we're using uh, backup for as well. And again, now we can choose everything that we want to restore. It has that uh, ability to know exactly what's there, that restore point. And we can decide what our type of conflict handling it is. Imagine that we have something in the cluster with similar names. There might be conflicts. So you can select what policy it is uh, and be as conservative or aggressive as you decide, desire in that scenario. And once that's done, you're going to go ahead and trigger that restore. And now we can actually go ahead and uh, confirm that uh, the restore is in progress. We can see the progress of that restore happening. So again, the agents are going to go into that uh, second cluster and they're going to pull from that uh, snapshot and they're going to restore all that, both configuration as well as uh, uh, any data and anything that you need there as well. So again, remember, we're here not just doing a uh, deploying of YAML files that actually has a MySQL database. And there's actual data being restored uh, as well in this case. 
And now we can just navigate to our recovery cluster and we'll see that our workload has just been deployed. So you can see in our uh, MySQL namespace, our two uh, kind of pods right there created four minutes ago with this restore. So, so far, so good. It was pretty simple, I hope. Just kind of an easy flow through the portal from both backup to recovery. Let's now confirm that everything is actually working. The persistent volume is there. As I mentioned, the data is there. So everything was properly restored. And a new service, in this case, was created. We could also try and preserve IPs if we had that in the service definition, if we're using static IPs. In this case, it's a new IP. So it's a recovery with a new IP and a new load balancer type service. OK, and the website now working pretty good. So pretty simple, the cluster to cluster recovery. Now, something that is usually in the past much harder is a region to region recovery. But it's pretty simple as well with AKS Backup, where you can just select uh, a secondary region for that restore. And you're going to go ahead and do the same exact thing we just did, but to a disaster recovery cluster, which again, you could have very little uh, footprint of. It could have its node pool at zero. Uh, whatever it is, the, the smallest footprint you want to have for your uh, disaster recovery cluster. And now you can restore to it and it could actually trigger scaling at that moment if you're doing that recovery. So again, if you're doing a more of a active passive type of scenario, you could now move your active into your DR cluster in case something happened with the primary as an example. And again, very much same thing except in this case we're in East US. And we're triggering a, we call a cross-region restore versus just a, a regular restore. But for you, the experience is pretty much the same. It's quite seamless. And you're just going to go and do the exact same thing as we did to our recovery cluster. You're just going to go on and in our DR cluster, check that everything has been deployed uh, as it was before. So you expect to see um, the same namespace, the same service, the same deployment. Um, same database, everything exactly that we took from the first one. And once again, we're going to have a service with a new IP. That if it loads, there we go. And if we actually find in our tiptoeing our namespace right there at the bottom, we're actually going to see a new service with a new IP created in this. Uh, regional VR cluster. We can access it really quickly. And as it loads, as you can expect, you're going to be able to see the same Azure Backup for AKS website that we started all the way in a different region in three clusters ago. So very, very simple experience that you might be used to if a lot of you are doing infrastructure and infrastructure backups in Azure. It's the same simple uh, interface and UI, but allowing you to take all this for cloud native and Kubernetes backups. All right, let's keep, let's keep going. I need to save some time, so I need to go fast. So Istio, a service mesh, a lot of you, who here is using or thinking of using Istio? All right, it's about half of the room, so pretty a, a big interest to all. So service meshes, um, very useful. Oftentimes we heard challenges from the users uh, that there are difficulties on using something like Istio, either for fine tuning it, or for coordinating upgrades because there's a control plane and the data plane, the sidecars, and you need to figure out what to do. You need to manage the life cycle. Then you need to have some experts in-house. And how does that work? So for that, AKS actually created the Istio Service Mesh add-on, a managed Istio offering that uh, gives you a fully managed control plane. It gives you a fully managed uh, ingress and, e uh, and uh, internal and external uh, gateways for ingress. And then uh, you can automatically inject the sidecars in your applications as you desire. This is now generally available, and it's generally available with all the functionality that it's already out. We're not done. There's a lot of things that we're already building, but all the functionality that is out there for Istio add-on is now generally available uh, since last month. And that includes things like canary upgrade for the control plane and the ingress gateways. What that means is you can actually, through AKS now, automatically do the upgrades, or more accurately, you manually trigger them, and we automatically do them. And we will automatically do the control plane and allow you to then decide 
when you're actually going to step by step do the data plane. So the way this works, as you can see from there, is you can start an upgrade, uh, you can roll it back, and then you can actually go namespace by namespace and rotate the data plane, meaning those sidecars that I just mentioned, the way it typically works is we'll do all that blue piece automatically and under the covers, but we're not gonna do the yellow because that's actually attached to your workload. So we don't wanna automatically rotate your workload uh, when you do the upgrade. So you can choose to go namespace by namespace and just uh, label it and at that moment, uh, that namespace's workloads are gonna rotate for it. You can also ask us to do all of it. Imagine it's a test cluster, but our default behavior will be upgrading only the blue piece and then allow you to go step by step on uh, your workloads. This also means the Certificate Authority plugin that enables clusters uh, uh, to have uh, mutual TLS uh, authentication and you actually um, bring your own CA. So all of this is also GA now with, uh, with the Istio add-on. You can essentially have root CA, intermediate CA, you can put that, uh, bring it from Key Vault or your preferred source. Also GA, as part of its features, is the mesh config and proxy config. So with that, you're also gonna get a ton of different configurations that are currently supported, allowed, or blocked. If you're asking about the differences and the words don't fully are self-explanatory, that means the first one that we fully support that setting, that configuration, you can tweak it, you can do whatever you want, and we support 100% of it. The second one means that we allow it, but don't support it. That's for things that we, you typically, we don't have a lot of say in, so we will allow you to do that, we will not block you, but there is not a lot that our support team can actually assist you with, so that's gonna be your own accord to use those settings. Uh, but you can do them, you can tweak them if you know what you're doing. The last one are settings that are, we've deemed at the moment too dangerous, uh, to allow uh, updates and changes on, so they're currently blocked. Uh, as usual with everything, we'd love to hear from you, so if there's anything that you uh, really need, if there's something that from this list that you've seen in the documentation that you maybe really need the allow to go to support it or vice versa, just let us know. And equally important, especially for these kind of beautiful demos that we've been seeing, is a portal experience. So today you already get a, the Canary Upgrade Portal experience where you can get all the same commands and abilities that we just saw in the portal. You can just go there and upgrade Istio. Once again, it will upgrade a control plane and you can then go and rotate each namespace as well all through the portal, all uh, the visual UI. And coming soon, we're also gonna have the full experience of uh, the certificate authority um, all in the portal as well. That should come in the next couple of months. I mentioned we're not done, and we're not nearly done. There's a ton of things we wanna bring in the service mesh space and in, with the Istio add-on. One of them is egress gateway. You might have seen in the past KubeCon, especially for those that uh, are uh, repeating on this day, a demo on something that we called um, static egress gateway. That, together with Istio's egress gateway, form a solution uh, that we believe is gonna be really, really powerful for controlling egress out of clusters. You can very granularly set up policies for egress. You can very granularly decide different deployments, get different IPs for egress. Um, some might share, some might have unique, and you can per deployment actually decide what their IP is. So you can do things like allow listing in a firewall on the other side or a database and have that full control or get different namespaces and different uh, labels, et cetera, to go to different egresses. So very, very powerful to get these two things together um, in combination. We also have uh, Mesh CA, and that's mostly of a hosted certificate authority that we really want to have a cross-cluster kind of traffic and communication support. Associated with that, the pool support for multi-cluster mesh, that's gonna be meshes across clusters, different AKS clusters, kind of same mesh. Uh, that's kind of the thinking behind it. Um, and this will need things, in case you were wondering on the question on, on Copilot before, when do you use something like Azure CNI VNet and when do you use something like Azure CNI Overlay, this could be a very good scenario to distinguish. With a VNet uh, case, you typically can enable scenarios like multi-cluster mesh where pods in different clusters are in a VNet horizontally and can talk to each other, whereas in an Overlay case, they are fully internal, you don't uh, spend any IPs whatsoever because they 
are only internal to the cluster, you can even repeat the same address space between the, both clusters. But in that case, you really shouldn't be doing something like a multi-cluster mesh because the expectation is that you, you typically go through the outbound and inbound flows of those clusters. So you go through either the load balancer and then uh, back manage NAT or whatever it is your, your paths there. And finally, observability. I'm not gonna go too much in detail. We have a very good session uh, later today on kind of AI assisted observability and troubleshooting. Um, but we were trying to make a lot of that easier. And with Istio, you get things like automatic injection, you can get automatic collection for Prometheus metrics on most workloads, and you'll see what all of that gives you uh, later today. But we want more. We want uh, better observability in terms of the TLS verification based scraping, uh, and also additional application insights um, automatically given to you. Let's keep going. Fleet Manager, also something we GA'd fairly recently and we keep adding updates towards. If you don't know what Fleet Manager is, uh, and we typically refer to it as Fleet, so if, we, if you hear us talk about this in the halls anywhere else, we typically shorten Azure Kubernetes Fleet Manager, which is the full name to Fleet. And that's, as the name kind of indicates, a collection of uh, Kubernetes, in this case AKS clusters, kind of managed uh, at scale, managed together, with uh, life cycle management, with workload placement across them. So there's many, many scenarios that you can use uh, Fleet Manager for, uh, and you can decide which ones you want it for. You, you might use them for all, you might use it for some, just different. So you can, for example, have clusters in different subscriptions, different regions added uh, to the same fleet, to that kind of, as it says there, a lightweight grouping of resources. And then you can just use the portal for it. That's a very fair use case. You might just want to see them aggregated together. You might want to see all the information from these clusters. A lot of our users are using it just for the visuals. So you can see the different versions across clusters. You can see what's uh, already in support, not supported. Uh, and you can have all the different abilities um, out there. You can use it also for its recently G8 multi-cluster upgrade capabilities. That actually allows you to put several of those clusters in different groups. And then you can create upgrade runs across them and define which cluster gets upgraded first, second, third, so on and so forth, which ones get upgraded in parallel, etc. So you can very easily think of this as uh, typically dev, test, QA, prod, and this could be your groups. You can have stages within them, so you can, for example, in the dev stage, you might have a primary and backup in the scenario that we saw before with DR. So you can have in your dev stage, um, sorry, in your dev group kind of a stage for uh, your primary and a stage for your secondary, and they, they go very close together, but one by one uh, separately, and then the different environments go um, sequentially. And you can stop this run at any point, uh, you can gate it with your approval, and you, you ensure that every single cluster that gets upgraded gets the exact same configuration as a previous cluster. So sometimes, especially for enterprises that might take a bit longer to do this, um, a key concern was ensuring that that last cluster was still the same as the first one. Because with the rapid pace of both Kubernetes and AKS, sometimes what happened is that last cluster that you upgraded might actually have different bits than the first one you started maybe a month ago. So this actually allows you to ensure that consistency across these environments. And then you can actually see these runs very easily. You can create your own runs. You can see where they go visually. You can see which clusters have been done, which clusters are running, if there were any issues. And again, as I mentioned, you can stop and continue. Uh, an additional note, and you're gonna see a little bit of this, especially on the cost session and more, is we also have a lot of other cool stuff with Fleet. Things like workload placement across clusters and we have a lot of updates into what you can do with workload placement. So you can define them, oh, I want some workloads on East US, West US. I want one replica across clusters. And you can do all that through Fleet, and Fleet is basically your orchestrator of clusters and will place everything in the different cluster for you. So we're really, really, really happy to show some of the innovations that we've been doing in workload placement to look at things like metrics, to look at things like cost, and uh, a lot more. And also to think about things like overrides are things that we really want to make sure that you can do because sometimes you might need to, over, to change things for a specific cluster while still having your whole fleet managed by fleet manager. And the other part, of course, that I mentioned was observability, which I think is a great segue for uh, 
one of our guest speakers of today, which I'm really, really happy to kind of uh, have with us today, which is the CVP for and Technical Fellow for Azure Networking, Kamala Deepak. Thank you so much, and a round of applause for you. And Deepak is going to walk us through what our innovations are on our advanced networking space. Yeah. How this is going. Yeah. Go Thank you, George. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today and sharing the awesome work that we are doing in the container networking space. Our mission at Microsoft is to provide you the best container networking platform out there, and we have been hard at work on it. Last year at KubeCon 2023, we announced Celium support in Azure CNI. Later that year, we announced uh, networking observability support in uh, Azure AKS. And today, we have additional announcements to make. So what we announced late last year was network observability support public preview in AKS. It's a solution that's based on eBPF. It provides key networking metrics that are aggregated at a node level. It is on-demand and configurable, and it emits metrics in an industry standard, uh, which are Prometheus metrics. So you can access those metrics with Azure Managed Prometheus and Grafana, that gets enabled seamlessly for you. Or if you have self-hosted Prometheus and Grafana, you can see those metrics there as well. This network observability solution supported all CNI flavors and was natively integrated in AKS managed environments. However, what it didn't have was pod level insights and advanced metrics. And we have heard from our customers that network observability is a key challenge that they face in managing their Kubernetes clusters. So to address that, today we are announcing advanced network observability in AKS. It provides deep traffic insights, which includes L4 connection metrics, layer seven metrics, like DNS metrics. It continues to work with all the CNIs and I have more details to share later in this presentation. And then it also enables network flow logs. So you can get very detailed view of which pod is talking to what pod at an individual flow level. In addition, it integrates with Hubble metrics, so you can use your familiar Hubble APIs and CLI and UI on top of this advanced network observability platform that we're making available. So let's look at what is different between the basic observability that we announced last year and the advanced observability that we're announcing today. So first of all, you get pod level metrics and not just load node level metrics. So you can look at metrics at a pod level, namespace level, service level, or node level. In addition, like I mentioned earlier, you now get DNS metrics. A Lot of our customers have shared feedback that they really want to look at DNS metrics, errors, and stuff like that. We also provide Hubble integration, and we provide historical network flow logs. Let me give you a brief demo here. Okay, so enabling advanced network observability is as simple as passing a parameter to AKS. And if you're running Azure Managed Grafana, then these metrics automatically show up in Azure Managed Grafana, as you can see over here. And these metrics, you can see from here, uh, incoming traffic, outgoing traffic, packets per second, as well as you can look at the drops, both incoming and outgoing. In addition, you can look at hotspots in the network at a pod level, which parts are sending the most traffic and which parts are receiving the most incoming traffic. You can also look at heat map in terms of packet drops. Again, at a pod level, you can see which parts are experiencing the most drops and can debug the issues further. Now let's look at DNS metrics. Similarly, you can look at DNS traffic, 
who are the DNS address space that various parts are talking to, what the drops at the various parts are. So you can pretty much look at all the detailed uh, metrics around DNS. Now here I show how you can access all this both for Cilium as well as non-Cilium nodes. So in this case, uh, this cluster is deployed without any Cilium and you can access the same metric for non-Cilium nodes as well. We realize that our customers, many of them are running various versions of CNI, right? Be it Calico, Cilium, whatever may be, we provide you the same level of network observability, observability no matter what kind of CNI you're running. And as I mentioned earlier, we've enabled it with Hubble, so you can use your familiar Hubble UI to look at these detailed metrics, as well as you can use CLI to access these metrics. Okay, so now let's look at how does this work. So you're probably familiar with, with the diagram on the left over here. Uh, with Cilium, all the various metrics that are available through eBPF get exposed via Hubble, and you can use these metrics in your visualizer of choice. However, on non Cilium nodes, we have brought all those benefits by introducing a component that we call Microsoft Retina. This component sits on top of eBPF and hooks underneath Hubble and makes all those metrics available for non Cilium CNIs as well. It gets even better. I'm excited to announce that we are making Microsoft Retina open source today. With Microsoft Retina, you get detailed network observability for all CNIs. And that's really, really exciting. And all this works on all the OS platforms on any cloud. So you can actually install Microsoft Retina on our competitors' clouds and get the same experience that you expect from Microsoft on AKS. So to check more, check out the, the URL over there. And then uh, I already talked about uh, its cross OS compatibility as well as compatibility with various uh, CNIs out there. We have a number of other announcements to make later in the day. Uh, prefix on Nick, which will help you scale your VNets for containers dramatically more than what is possible today. Um, but I'll hand it back to George at this time to make more announcements. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Deepak. Awesome. <laughs> awesome stuff. We've been teasing about this unnamed open source project for a while. Uh, so we're really happy to, to finally put it out there. We're very happy to kind of start working in the open source of the community. Uh, it's a lot of really cool stuff that we're, we're doing. And again, as, as Epac mentioned later today, we're going to have a networking best practices session. We also have an observability session. So this really is something that brings both of those sessions together. So you're going to hear a lot about Retina on both of them. Uh, and we're really happy with all the capabilities it provides. Let's keep going. We need to go get some coffee. I know all of you are desperate for some. Maybe it's just me, um, but I kind of need it. So let's keep going. There's a lot of improvements that we've been doing over the last uh, six months or so. The first are um, a few GAs. On the Windows side, we have the ability to support Generation 2 VMs, UFI boot, on Windows Server 2022 and above. Have a lot of security improvements, have better boot time and faster boot time. Um, and just a better boot architecture and allow for a lot of features uh, that are required. Things like confidential VMs and much more are all reliant on this uh, gen generation two support in there. So we're really happy to bring this to Windows and start to default it uh, to all of you right away. It's something that you should not feel, but we're gonna give you a lot more, uh, again, speed as well as additional features. The second one is uh, to keep parity with our Windows capabilities. We have now custom kubelet configuration uh, parameters for Windows, so you can configure the Windows kubelet parameters, kind of very similar to what you were able to do with Linux before, so you can set up uh, several parameters like the CPU, um, uh, kind of different uh, CPU parameters for, for a kubelet. You can uh, eventually be able to support different OS settings, so keep us kind of 
in the loop. I know some of you have already reached out to different settings that you might want for Windows. So um, make sure that you, you set up an issue or reach out to us throughout the day today, especially Ali, who's somewhere in the back, is saying hi. Uh, if you have any uh, asks in terms of both Kubelet settings um, as well as OS settings that you want for Windows, just let us know, and we're happy to kind of support uh, your use cases. Another one that is really exciting, um, both in the, in the advent of AI, but also for gaming. A lot of our gaming customers have been asking for this for a while, is the ability to have uh, Windows GPU nodes with GPU support and containers. And so we're really happy to preview this and uh, enabling uh, GPUs in Windows for compute intensive workloads, graphics, visualizations, but also games. So this you can just select a, a VM, a SKU, that has a GPU, and much like with Linux, you're gonna get the, 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 uh, the drivers for the OS as well as the drivers for containers installed for you, and you can use it for your workloads. Another one that, if there's any of you on Twitter, you shouldn't be on Twitter, you should be paying attention to this session, but if any of you are on Twitter, um, I just posted one of the latest AKS trivia questions. If you don't know what the AKS trivia questions are, then you should go on Twitter on the break uh, and actually check it out uh, because we're running a trivia contest for a few weeks now and the prize is actually this nice hoodie. And uh, whoever wins uh, and answers most of the questions uh, is gonna get uh, one of these hoodies at the end of KubeCon. We'll be asking some of these questions throughout the sessions today. Uh, maybe in the break, who knows? Uh, I will be putting them all on Twitter and you know, that's where you can answer. And we're also gonna be revealing some of them throughout our sessions at our booth. So our booth in the event is gonna have a ton of uh, different theater sessions on the breaks at KubeCon that you can go and attend. Really, really cool sessions for a lot of different topics that we can cover. So definitely uh, check those out. Uh, and keep an eye on Twitter. Uh, you might see some of these trivia questions and win one of these explended hoodies, um, as well as as many stickers as uh, your heart desires. Uh, infinite amount of stickers. So the question is actually answered by node soak duration, which is uh, the ability in the parameter that actually allows you to have a wait time, kind of a bake time or soak time as the name indicates, between the nodes being upgraded. So AKS upgrades each node in a rolling fashion, and between these nodes, it's typically the pod disruption budgets that control uh, the amount of time that you're waiting by allowing or not the pods to be evicted. However, in many cases, you might be, for example, the owner of a platform and have many teams working there and you might not still be able to uh, kind of have them use PDBs correctly and use uh, all kinds of things correctly. More on that shortly. Sometimes it might fail if the PDB is there. Yeah. Uh, and if it's incorrectly set, again, more on that in a few minutes on how to actually get those automatically done. But because of that, you sometimes might need that extra time between nodes, uh, five minutes, 10 minutes, and that's what soak duration allows you to do. So you can configure that, and so between each node or each uh, different uh, batch in our search, you are gonna wait that extra time in addition to the time that typically you would wait for the PTBs. So this should allow, for example, for cases that might not have the best probes in terms of readiness uh, in place or the PTBs might um, not exist, it will give you that time for the applications to start on the new node, for example. More stuff. You might or might not be aware of the AKS developer extension and the AKS extension in VS Code. Anyone here using the AKS extension in VS Code? Kind of a few hands. Anyone here aware of the Kubernetes extension in VS Code? A few more, all right. Oh yes, we have Ralph there, uh, one of the earlier champions just in silent regurgitation of like what <laughs> it's gonna go there. Um, um, so the AKS extension is actually built on top of the Kubernetes extension and delivers AKS specific capabilities where the Kubernetes extension uh, that Ralph was one of the original creators of delivers a general Kubernetes capabilities like seeing pods, seeing deployments across different clusters. The AKS extension actually allows you to do things like create AKS clusters. It allows you to switch context between them and do many tasks, um, and recently so, uh, we had a few commands added on, things like capturing TCP dumps, uh, running image cleaner to clean uh, both unused images or unsecure images, uh, running Spectre gadget commands for additional troubleshooting from different traces, as well as uh, 
cancel operations, abort them. So many, many different uh, capabilities that you typically might use the CLI or portal to. You can actually don't need to exit VS Code for those operations. And you can actually do a ton more if you bring in the dev side of things. Um, so you can do things like use draft as part of this extension that allows you to automatically containerize an application and deploy it via pipelines, as I mentioned before. So a lot of really, really, really cool things uh, out there for you. Now, PDBs um, typically is about this time where we start to discuss the problems, the pros and cons of PDBs and why we love them and why we hate them. And this is typically because they're one of the most fundamental mechanisms for reliability in Kubernetes at the same time. It has a big if they're set correctly uh, and everything else is correct, which is a huge if. So for a while, we've been working on something that has had probably about 25 names, um, and we might have shared even some of these with you before. Uh, the current name is Deployment Safeguards, so you might not know what's coming, but some of you, uh, I think, have already witnessed some of this. So in order to help a lot of the teams, both individual teams owning clusters as well as teams sharing clusters or, or managing clusters on behalf of multiple individual teams, one of the key both challenges and asks is how can I help my teams correctly set up their deployments? How can I warn them? How can I ensure my cluster is well set up so that when I upgrade or when there is any problem like an infrastructure issue, everything is uh, set up accordingly and according to best practices. There's a ton of best practices there. Uh, I think I heard yesterday something like the ACAST docs uh, are a little bit like you know the, uh, the Irishman. Long, good, but long. And so that's uh, kind, kind of the same thing uh, as Ricky Gervais said on, on the Oscars. Like it, it, it's quite a lot of best practices out there. So how can we actually make that a bit more um, friendly and easier to consume, especially for maybe teams that are not as experienced? <coughs> so without further ado, we're really happy to introduce deployment safeguards, which uh, allow you to uh, when you enable this, automatically enforce a set of best practices in a cluster. Now this uses an existing mechanism of uh, Gatekeeper and Azure policy. So you might already know this feature out there where you can go and set up policies for yourself, things like, hey, uh, I want to make sure I, we only pull from our registries and things like that. And it's really good, really cool, everybody should check it out. It has a little drawback, which is you need to know the policies to use, you need to select them, you need to configure them, and some of them you might still need to parameterize them. You need to put parameters on, and oftentimes they're just kind of a yes or no type of problem. And there's many exceptions as well. So uh, with safeguards, you actually get the additional help, and we're gonna see that in a bit. You're gonna get warnings, where as you deploy something, both on your pipelines as well as manually, you're gonna get warnings on the things that you are not doing correctly, so that you get informed on things that you need to fix. So for, again, developer teams that might be just trying things for the first time, uh, they actually gonna be able to get those warnings right away as they deploy whatever mechanism they use. Uh, you can use them to enforce. That's very similar to behavior of policy where you're gonna be able to say yes or no based on those things. And we're about to launch the actual mode that is more interesting in my opinion, which is a mode that will do it for you. So when developers actually set up something that doesn't have probes or doesn't have PDBs, AKS will set up basic probes and basic PDBs and resources and limits for those uh, resources automatically. So this should hopefully bring a lot together platform teams and uh, dev teams and different business units uh, that have been struggling a little bit between these different kind of tasks. Let's see a little sneak peek <clears throat> of how this actually looks like uh, really quick. So what you're seeing here is a pod that just so happens to be using a label right there that it shouldn't because it's a reserved label and it's really missing a lot of stuff. So when you actually apply this YAML with safeguards, you get all of those warnings automatically popping up. You deployed, we didn't block you because you're in warning mode. It will block you if we move this into enforcement mode and again, it will actually fix those for you if we move it to mutation mode. So when you move it to enforcement mode, you can do the exact same command I just did and you're gonna get the same errors except they're not gonna be warnings. They're actually gonna be errors and it will block your deployment. So things like, well, probes were not there, liveness, readiness, PDBs were not placed with it, resources and limits were not specified, and a bad label was used as well. 
So this, this little thing that is typically part of all samples, a lot of problems with it. Moreover, even if you use deployments and you go to a few more intricate uh, things, for example, different settings over there, um, multiple replicas, you're gonna get a lot more. You're gonna get things like, even if your PDB is misconfigured, like you have two replicas, PDB minimum of two, that will immediately block all upgrades. You're gonna get that flagged as both a warning or a blockage as well. And once again, it will be fixed for you if you're using mutation. So we're really, really happy with bringing this feature. It's gonna be part of a lot of different functionality that AKS is gonna be bringing up. It's gonna be a centerpiece of a lot of functionality. And we're really happy to hear from you. A lot of the best practices that it incorporates are both from our team, but also from asks of a lot of you, and as well as from our field experts that I'm sure are working with a lot of you folks. As part of all of this, uh, and as I'm sure it, it runs to the mind, is what if I want to change something? What if I want to add something? Well, this is, that's why this is built on top of policy. You can still essentially add any policy that you want on top of it, as well as to change it uh, accordingly. So the best practices here, they're very generic. They're meant to be like that. They're meant to be kind of like the defaults uh, that you have on SecComp or AppArmor. Uh, so very sane and very generic, but then you can go and add more specificities that are unique to you and maybe unique to your teams on top of it, and they will not conflict because the policy engine is still the single place that orchestrates them. All right, I know everybody is really eager to just go in and grab a coffee, so uh, I'll wrap it up just with two things. First, a big call out for the rest of the day. As I mentioned, we're gonna get a lot more announcements that I didn't mention here today. Uh, in, I think, all sessions, we're going to get pretty cool announcements. Um, we're going to have our uh, secure environments with Michael, Coco, and Charles. Uh, we're going to have uh, the AI-assisted uh, observability and troubleshooting um, with Aritra, Pavnit, and Kushpu. We're going to have a session focused on cost optimization uh, with Casey and Karthik. Um, we're going to wrap up the AKS on sessions with the networking best practices with Chase, Patrick, and Neha. And then we're gonna have our wonderful partners kind of talking a lot about how the ecosystem uh, makes it even more real that Azure is a Kubernetes powered cloud and how they're helping us uh, together with all our internal partners making that reality. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. I see you in the halls and thank you very much.